Even for avid supporters of Ukraine, like me, Ukrainian literature remains an undiscovered country. Today, I'm speaking with Maria Shuvalova, who can guide us on a journey of discovery to engage with Ukrainian culture and identity. Ukrainian literature has a strong tradition of folk tales and oral poetry, and it's been influenced by the country's complex political and cultural history, including periods of colonization and national struggle. Russian literature, on the other hand, has been shaped by its own distinct history, including periods of imperial expansion and revolutionary upheaval. Ukrainian writers were persecuted in the 1920s during the period of Soviet rule in Ukraine as part of a process to suppress Ukrainian national identity and culture and replace it with a new Soviet identity. Literature was a key tool for this, as it is also a key tool for Russian propagandists today. Welcome to Silicon Curtain. All our content is also available on popular podcast platforms like Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Please do like and subscribe to help people find our fantastic speakers. And if you enjoy the content, please do consider becoming a patron. Maria Shuvala is a doctoral candidate at the National University of Kiev Mikhaila Academy. In 2019-20, she was a Fulbright Scholar at Columbia University in New York. Her major fields of specialization are comparative literature and contemporary Ukrainian literature, and her minor fields are identity and memory studies and translation. She is also prominent in the media on topics of Ukrainian culture and talks eloquently about Russian cultural colonialism and the efforts to decolonize literature and Ukrainian studies. Welcome to the channel, Maria. Hi, it's a huge pleasure to be here today. I'm grateful for you being so patient while setting up this meeting. And my apologies if today I'll forget the name or we'll talk a bit slower. It's another hectic night in Kyiv as I guess in 1 a.m. we got a raid alert and it lasted more than four hours. And Kyiv was again attacked by 35 drones. So it's a sleepless night, but in the morning like that, I sincerely appreciate that I have a chance to talk more about what's going on and broader perspectives on that. It's fascinating how war touch all our spheres, not only economy or law, but literature and our own myth settings and mindsets. It is extraordinary, isn't it? And, and, and something like the attack you've just mentioned, I mean... A year ago, that would have made headline news. It had been on the front cover of every newspaper. Now, unfortunately, we have media fatigue, war fatigue. Um, the media does not really work well on so-called repetition, even if it's repetition of aggression. And so a lot of this gets relegated to the center of a newspaper, the back pages, if it's mentioned at all. That must be extremely uh, frustrating for you and other Ukrainians. Yeah, that's exactly the thought I, I had this morning as 35 drones, four hours of explosion, work of air defense system, and one civilian's apartment building was destroyed again. So there is, again, casual, casualties on the civilian side and zero headlines. And um, in general, people are pretty optimistic about Ukrainian win, like Ukraine will win, they are so brave. But being here and going through that, you, you clearly feel that war is a mess. So uh, the enemy outnumber us in the resources, in people, and we're such a small country. And that means that each of us here, of each of you there who support Ukraine, we have to work so efficiently and support the resistance very long, very enthusiastic. And it's a huge challenge. So you have to completely change your life. All literary scholars who had just small audience like me, we are also keep fundraising for our relatives who are on the front line. We constantly need drones. And it reminds me the Second Second World War and all other Ukrainian periods in history when literary scholars or, or literary critics, they will also deal with state building and national security and defense. And just 
Sometimes it feels too much for 29 year old literary scholar with zero experience in military stuff, national building and so on and so on. But it's necessary because there is still chance that we won't survive and we won't have Ukrainian culture because still have a chance for slow decay, colonization and a huge amount of problems. But sometimes you just find the right word or find the right motivation inside yourself and just and that might change you, I, you know i always not understand this concept of small person a little man in russian literature i didn't study this literature so much but we had some lessons in school and on the intuitive level the concept of little man was so depressing and so wrong Somehow it was so popular abroad and in literary theory. And finally, with the full-scale invasion, <laughs> which shows that uh, it's not a very nice concept because one person can change a lot, an agency of just ordinary people. So I like contemporary Ukrainian short stories for this huge contrast that little people on the right spot with the right settings and the amount of actions, they matter a lot. It's interesting, isn't it? Well, I mean, we are going to talk about uh, Ukrainian literature predominantly, um, but this idea of the little man, the the psychologically damaged, traumatized individual, uh, it's almost sort of pre Kafka esque, isn't it? It's the small person stuck in a in a huge bureaucratic system, and there are of course different schools. You know, you have the more aristocratic school of of of, of Russian literature where you can get the illusion that people are sort of free from Turgenev and Tolstoy, who were obviously aristocratic figures, Lermontov and, and Pushkin. Um, you, you, you get that sort of sense that yeah, Russia is a free society, but that's because they're a tiny part of the aristocratic elite. Whereas the part of literature that exemplifies the small man um Ironically, it's yes, Dostoevsky wrote quite a lot about that, and, and there's the sort of traumatized uh, individual comes through very prominently there. But actually, the, the main exemplar of that is um, uh, Nikolai Gogol, or I'm going to pronounce it horrifically, Mikhola Hochul. I don't know if I pronounced that correctly, who, of course, is Ukrainian. And um, I was going to ask this question later on, but it seems like a good time to ask it now. Um, did it take an outsider? I mean, is it, is it, could something like Dead Souls only have been written by someone from the outside, um, by Ukrainian and someone who's brought up in a different uh, culture, essentially? I completely agree with you. Now, let's turn to what we really want to talk about, which is fully Ukrainian literature. Um, and as someone who uh, knows very, very little uh, now, what what is the kind of primer uh, of Ukrainian literature? Where would I need to start uh, in order to to start my journey of discovery? Great questions. I want to recommend you a huge amount of books. The main issue we have is the absence of translations. So the main reasons broader audience is not familiar with Ukrainian literature is that for centuries, Ukrainian writers, they did not have an access to publishers. And these days, situation is a bit better, but still there is a challenge to, to find my favorite pieces in English translation, nevertheless. I hope I hope more people will learn Ukrainian and also will provide more translations as well. But give I, I prepared a short list for you guys. So I will just open it. And what I like was the first thing about contemporary Ukrainian literature you have to know is it's very diverse. It's uh, not only literature in Ukrainian language, but it's also literature in Crimean Tatar language. And as my friend Sasha Dovzik from Ukrainian London Institute, who wrote a lot of pieces on Ukrainian literature for CNN and so on, mentioned that um, Ashkenazi Jews are able to learn about their own literature on the joining Ukrainian literature classes abroad because it's not covered by other curriculums. So Ukrainian literature has a lot of works by Ashkenazi Jews. And uh, 
other nationalities. So it's pretty diverse. And uh, speaking as our as our topic is resistance, and we're living in a very violent war, I will recommend uh, the most exciting books that are published in English and they dedicated to this topic, the topic of resistance. So uh, contemporary Ukrainian literature was so fascinating for me because uh, in 1991, when the isolation stopped being present in our discourse, Ukrainians discovered that they missed so much time that there was so much literary series, different books that were not available. So in 1990s, we had this huge amount of information. We have no time to proceed. So even in 1990s, life was so dynamic, so diverse. And uh, we now have this feeling, like this huge amount of information. We are not able to proceed. So it was cool to have it back in 1990s. So it's a bit easier in this digital and fast-paced informational time. And um, uh, that was the reason to dedicate myself to contemporary Ukrainian literature. And I was never interested in the war narratives or, or, or something like that. But when I was 21 years old, when I was a master's student, uh, the member of my family who volunteeringly joined the army in 2014, when Ukraine was attacked, this person got a mine and lost a leg. I was very shocked when I got a call. We immediately go to the hospital to provide help, assistance. It was a lot of stuff to manage when such things happened. And I remember I was so shocked by seeing what the war actually mean, because in one room in a hospital with my family member was soldiers without arms and without legs. And one of them was just without half of the head. And I remember I was not able to talk about that with my friends, with my family members. And as a literature was always a way for me to explore the war, I started reading more books dedicated to contemporary war. And in 2014, I, I, I might, might admit there will, was outburst of so-called war literature, novels, sketches, short stories, essays, diaries, memoirs. So the war started in 2014. And first, first books was published in 2015. Like in 2019, Ganna Skorkina, Ukrainian literary scholar, made a list. She started counting how much books published dedicated to the war. And in 2019, the amount of books exceeded 600. And I, I am glad that Jeffrey Stefaniuk translated into English the article by Ganna Skorkina, War Books, recording the Russo-Ukrainian war in Crimea and Donbass in English. So you'll be able also to scroll, to read, and to find all these 600 books. And Ganes Korkina not only made the first attempt to catalog and categorize books, it was a poetry about war, novels, essays, nonfiction, comics, and graphic novels, but she also gave the main understanding who authors were, it was soldiers, professional writers, military campaigns, volunteers, civilian journalists, military journalists as well, internally displaced people, family members of decayed soldiers and ordinary Ukrainians and foreigners as well. And uh, as Ukrainian literary scholar Marina Ryabchenko, uh, noted significant proportion of war literature based on author's personal experience. A huge amount of diaries, literary reportages, essays, and texts that document war, mm. that document battles, medical service on the battlefront, life in captivity, and life in the concentration camps. Now, that's that... important, isn't it? I mean, that's incredibly important to reflect the reality that's going on. But it also makes me think that it's also such a waste because, you know, those themes which are essential and important at the moment, it makes you think what would have been written about 
if writers weren't forced to write about that, there would be other themes, other exploration. And, you know, it, it, it also it makes me think about, you know, how many lives have been dedicated to fighting, you know, tyranny or autocracy when actually, you know, those same brains and minds could have been doing something, something else. Um, and it seems to be a generational struggle as well, you know, in the 19th century, the 18th century, the 20th century, um, it's totally deformed and warped by the need to, you know, whether it's fight authoritarianism in peacetime and fight aggression in wartime. Exactly. You just, I clearly remember my feeling when in 10, February 24, I saw a lot, a huge column of tanks at night when I was trying to leave Kiev and find a safer place around that. And when the rockets are flying over your head, you clearly understand that being a literary scholar it's so useless. So it's just so useless and rockets and tanks, they do not care. Are you a literary scholar or no? You Are you PhD or no? Are you completely not into politic or no? So a close range violence completely changed the perspective of what you have to do in this life. And it feels like you are no longer have your own life and your own choices because you're forced to survive. And that's, you start doing absolutely another stuff in your life to provide surviving. And that's how from a literature, literature has so many uh, applications and that's like this close range violence. They switched a lot of writers from literature as an art to literature as a resistance and survival also another stuff it's so important to remember and to ensure that in future we won't let the situation happen again so if not to document all the horrors and next generation might easily forget about that danger and that it might happen again like my generation did i was born in 1993 and I was first generation of Ukrainians who didn't suffer Russian aggression, uh, who didn't go through famine as my great parents, whose labor was not used as a free labor to build something like that. So first time in my life, my generation had access to education, no terrible stuff till 2014, of course. And it was so easy, relaxing to believe that we're a very developed country. It's 21st century. We're too, we're too smart, too civilized to have violence like that. And my generation who had not, I won't generalize. I will talk about myself. I, as a representative of a generation who had very nice independent life, I was uh, I, I was having doubts that such huge violence may exist in the 21st century. So it's At also the same time. Yeah. Yeah. Has yeah. it also accelerated, however, the evolution of Ukrainian identity? I mean, certainly from articles I've read, it's accelerated the publishing industry in Ukrainian language. And as you say, the amount of literature that was perhaps uh, not actively being printed a lot is is now coming from the archive to be printed and there's a huge uptake of uh, books and materials in ukrainian a sort of uh, you know renaissance in the publishing industry um you know one wouldn't wish for a war to be the catalyst of that but nonetheless has it accelerated this evolution and intensification of discovery of what it means to be ukrainian I believe it changed the perspective how Ukrainian identity is seen abroad. But from our inner perspective, there is a long history of civil engagement of Ukrainians, of resistance. So it's not the first time, as you may read in the article by Daria Mattingly, which was published for CNN about Holodomor, artificial famine in Ukraine in 1930s. Uh, Soviet government in Ukraine was uh, reporting to Stalin that Ukrainians, local Ukrainians, uh, 
they are kicked out all Soviet governors from villagers because they were not liking that. And that was threatening the whole Soviet regime. Therefore, the artificial famine was planned and aimed Ukrainian-speaking peasants' population and Ukrainian intelligentsia. But it's an, we already had this massive history of civilian engagement, but it was not communicated. People just were not people abroad who don't know Ukrainian history very, very well. They was not aware of that. So that's my point. And in, before the war, it was very prosperous years. Uh, first of all, IT sphere was very actively developing in Ukraine businesses that uh, increase um, the middle level of the salary Ukrainians were having and that's allowed more leisure more books and even before that ukrainian book festival even before the war ukrainian book festival was named the, the most successful and the best book festival in europe our books got a lot of international awards here is a poster by my, by my friend maria kinovich uh, she sells these posters to donate all money for small uh, volunteering initiatives, but Maria was recognized by World uh, Illustration Award as one of most prominent Ukraine, one of most prominent illustrators. So, in different spheres, even before the war, we were flourishing because we were actively doing reforms for many years. Of course, there was failures, there there was problems, and so on and so on. But in general, we was very successful in working on economy and reforms even before the war. So actually, it's for from my inner perspective, it's definitely stopped our inner development, but increased the level of awareness about our history, our identity, and our development abroad. And of course, many people, quite understandably, who uh, speak fluent Russian as a second language are choosing not to do so. And it's absolutely understandable why that is. But also a lot of people uh, from the East, some of whom I'm speaking to, um, their Ukrainian would have been a second language and needs work and they can read it, but not necessarily as fluent spoken. I think many people are now choosing to converse in Ukrainian and try to improve their Ukrainian language. So the the, the total or the result, end result of this war uh, will likely be Ukrainian victory. I think we all believe in that. Most people watching this channel believe in that. But it also means a, um, dare I say, you know, Ukrainian language having a far uh, greater usage right across the territory of Ukraine. Um, and, you know, what Russia has done is destroy what was an extremely interchangeable multicultural, multilingual society where people felt comfortable uh, speaking multiple languages and having multiple sort of identities, um, you know, coexisting. Uh, Russia, of course, I think for maybe a generation has destroyed that and will have enhanced the uh, usage of Ukrainian language. Yeah, uh, that's true. I also uh, highlight the diversity of Ukrainian identities and how Russians are working with it. I highly recommend the book by Olga Bertelsen, Ukrainian Intelligentsia in the Labyrinth of KGB. It's about special measures on Kharkiv Intelligentsia that was very diverse, and it was used again that in late 1960s, 1980s. And just these days, we, we realize uh, the correlation uh, of language, literature, and national security. And no one wants to be rescued by Russians. No one wants they come again to our homes. So the moment you realize that, you understand that language, it's also political tool. Some countries might not use language as a political tool, but our neighbors use. So another way is that literature and language and culture ensure the safety and security for future generation. And uh, another thing about the connection of national security and literature. So when in 2014, 2015, I started reading more Ukrainian books dedicated to recent war. 
And uh, if you also would like to resume this journey, I highly recommend you few books. Give me a second to open. First of all, there is just a second. Um, first of all, uh, I really like that Ukrainian literature about the war represented by professional professional writers, internally displaced people, and volunteers and female scholars and relatives of decayed soldiers. So it's huge diversity. You will be able to engage with such a different stories. And also there is uh, research, different research about that. And um, I highly recommend the airport by Sergei Luiko. It's very, it's very iconic situation because the defense of uh, uh, airport in Donetsk area was lasting more than two hundred days, and again, it this this outstanding event was partly mainly ignored for the world community. So uh, it's always strange that after very heroic event of Donetsk airport, uh, international community was not aware of how Ukrainians are dedicated to to protect their own land. So I highly recommend because only an excerpt was translated into English for in the journal Zodessa Review. I highly recommend Apricots of Donbass by Luba Yakimchuk, fully translated into uh, English words for war, new poems from Ukraine, edited by Oksana Maksimchuk and Max Rosochinsky. I one of my most favorite books, it's Absolute Zero by Artem Chak. And of course, Isolation by Stanislav Aseyev, who was in concentration camps in Donetsk area. It's, he's a journalist who voluntarily stayed in occupied territories and was reporting about his experience. And very special book, which I highly recommend, is Daughter by Tamara Hori Hazerny. It's a very special book. Uh, the author, she is a translator herself, very successful, commercially successful. When the war started in 2014, she volunteeringly went to Donetsk and Luhansk and started volunteering and helping Ukrainian soldiers to get means of protection. And she was very fascinated on everything that happened there. And this novel, Daughter, is based on a real event that is a real protagonist of main character. And this novel very accurately document mood uh, surrounding what people were having in supermarkets, how they were talking, what they were thinking. And also, it's written and translated really good. It's grasping, fascinating, and it's so important to get back to 2014, to have the full picture of what of what we have now and uh, when i was doing i was preparing for an international conference and were picking a topic to to my paper and i thought like ukrainian writers journalists volunteers they are going to uh, donetsk luhansk district and they are reflecting what this war for them so i was just hit by the thought so probably some russian writers volunteer or so on they are going there as well and they probably write fiction about that as well and i was so excited by this so to understand what the war means for them why is why are they going there you know as a person who doing comparative studies you always want to compare one more perspective so probably they also have certain meanings and motivations to go. It was pretty challenging to find novels or fiction like that because prominent Russian writers do not write about contemporary war between Russia and Ukraine. And uh, Russian artists are not joining volunteering battalions and best Russian poets are not dying in the trenches. Like one of the most prominent Ukrainian poets, like uh, Hlib, uh, one second, Hlib Babich, very, a very prominent Ukrainian author who died on the war last year. Nevertheless, I found novels written about written by Russian authors about current Russian-Ukrainian war 
Uh, they, there were several features of this fiction, but one is the most prominent. It shocked me and highlighted the relation between literature and security one more time. A part of novels about contemporary Russian aggression against Ukraine was written before the actual invasion happened. In 2009, a fantasy novel, genre is defined by the author, called Battlefield is Sevastopol, correct spelling of this Ukrainian city is Sevastopol, by George Savitsky was published. In 2011, this book won national prize, was, was presented of a number of festivals, and to, to get you idea what kind of book it is, I will write, I will read an annotation of this novel. It was never translated into English, so English-speaking audience will never have a chance, but I'll provide this chance right now. So 2009, Battlefield is Sevastopol by George Savitsky. Near future. By near future, guys, mean 2011, 2012. Near future. Russophobic policy of Ukrainians' orange authorities provoke a new Ukrainian war. American and Turkish peacekeepers occupied rebellious Sevastopol. Breaking all international agreements, the nuclear aircraft carrier Ronald Reagan, by the way, this aircraft carrier is now in museum in just a piece of metal, and the battleship Iowa entered the Black Sea. What can destroy these monsters? Only Russian submarines. American armor boils under the blows. Iowa's main battery turrets are blown by the explosion of ammunition. The aircraft carrier Ronald Reagan is boarded by Russian Marines and landed from the sea. Landing, of, landing ship of the Black Sea Fleet under the cover of the Guard Cruiser Moskva rush to help the insurgent Sevastopol. And um, it's only one example. But... A lot of irony there, isn't there? With the mention of Moskva, of course. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Favorite part of that. And also I found more novels like that. In each of them, uh, Ukraine had uh, Russophobic policies and was suppressing Russian-speaking population. And the United States wanted to start third world war and they just uh they just annoyed this world by threatening uh, the whole world with nuclear weapon therefore russian army is going to save everyone to save ukrainian democracy to save russian speaking population and of course save the world from this world third world the third world war and um the most interesting part of that, that books was presented of number of festivals, that some of this author was interviewed by New York Times. And uh, when after these books was released, Russian medias started talking that great Russian literature predicted inevitable war. And also this myth of great Russian literature was used for English speaking audience during interviews with the authors to justify the aggression and the invasion that, yes, and great Russian writers believe that the best way is to keep reg regime to fall, then everything will be really fine for people, for insurgents in Donetsk and Luhansk region. So, and of course, I believe it's so successful strategy, especially uh, working with the narrative of great Russian literature and that great Russian writers predicted that because all of all these novels are not available in English. So and it's, for... a, it's a preconditioning, isn't it? It's a preconditioning for propaganda. Um, 
And this novel isn't just in isolation. It's not prophetic because it exists in a publishing system, which, you know, having spoken with 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 some academics like uh, Ian Garner and others, they talked about the retooling and weaponization of the publishing industry in Russia prior to the invasion of Crimea. They talked about the use of tropes and stereotypes and caricatures of uh, Ukrainians um, going back to the early 2000s, which also echoed stereotypes used in, in, in sort of Soviet, Soviet media, but essentially the portrayal of Ukrainians not as advanced Europeans with a sophisticated literature, uh, as technologists and engineers. Um, and let's remember that a big part of Russia's space race was thanks to uh, you know, a character, the engineer, who was in fact Ukrainian. I mean, he was Soviet, but he was he was Ukrainian. I mean, Ukraine has, uh, you know, is at the cutting edge or was at the cutting edge of Soviet industry and technology. And yet Russia, right up until the present, has sought to characterize Ukrainians as uh, thieves, uh, sort of cunning people of, of, of low moral integrity, um, bandits, at best, you know, jolly, jolly peasants um, with a with a with a an inferior um, or far more secular kind of uh, rural culture. Um, these stereotypes are part of a clear imperial ingression, and the Russian publishing industry was tooled up to create genres of books to support what essentially was an imperial narrative and future aggression. Um, all of this seems to not be known uh, for some reason as you say new york times and others interview these these characters yeah and uh, exactly and also if if you'll monitor uh, talks of russian politicians for example dugin he was saying the same thing this writer wrote in 2006 so definitely there is a lot of correlations between what the state is is we're about to do and these authors keep spreading these narratives. I I I I had a conversation about a presentation of international conference. It was as ACs in 2019 in Zagreb. And people were very skeptical when I was presenting that in 2019. They thought that I'm like a oh, young Ukrainian emotional woman that probably overthink. And when the full-scale invasion happened, I lost all my jobs. Uh, but my colleagues from academia, they was inviting me to talks, presentations, and lectures, and con conferences. Uh, they were pushing me to, to talk about this topic one more time. And that, that was when the moment I realized that during the war, you still can, have, can be partly a scholar. And I started talking about these books one more time. And some people were fascinated that it was ignored. by. But some people keep, uh, keep saying that it cannot be true. New York Times could not interview the author like that. Probably Marie is a very emotional woman that is dealing with stress. And like she may probably she is traumatized by the war. It, it cannot be true. And then when uh, I show the article, the interview, books, translations, and also highlight that I did Fulbright in Columbia University. Like, okay, so you had American education, so probably you're most uh, trustful than we thought before. And like, okay, but we are sure that will never happen again. So indeed, this narrative that was spread by Russian literature previously, about Ukrainians, that they're not very smart, not very credible. Uh, I personally can feel that in 2023. So uh, it's it's also visible in academia these days. Uh, I, was, I, I, I was shocked by the fact that brought a lot of people might not read the language of the country they work with. So of course, that's why huge massive of content of literature might be missed also a lot of people do not understand scholars do not understand the popularity of telegram channels in russian 
and they do not read telegram channels of authors like this, of prominent Russian liberals. They, they write more openly about their mindset, their plans, and their beliefs that they present in Western conferences. So this day is very important to engage with local context, to be very accurate in your expertise, which also means languages. So we all understand how how much we have to work in order to ensure uh, good expertise and not distorted expertise. And this was a huge challenge to academia, Ukrainian academia as well, and the world academia also. I'd like to talk as well about, and I know your, your expertise is in uh, contemporary literature, but I'd like to talk a bit about origin stories, because a key part of deep Russian propaganda, historical mythology, gets to the very heart of the origin story of the Russian state, uh, which is highly mythologized and weaponized. And of course, you know, every country has its own mythologized origin stories. Ukraine, had a, obviously a big process of, of identity and nation building uh, through you know, the 18th, 19th centuries. Um, I'd like to explore how those are represented in literature, because, of course, a key part of Russian propaganda is that Ukraine is not a thing. It's not an independent entity. It's a subset of, uh, of, of, of Muscovy, essentially. Um, when actually here we see probably one of the biggest thefts, cultural identity and historical thefts, in plain sight, in history, which is the appropriation of Kievan Rus, um, even the name itself. Um, and to this day, it's used to, to brainwash. Now, what does literature tell us about the emergence of the Ukrainian identity that counters this Russian myth that Ukraine, uh, you know, either came into existence in 1917 or, you know, has never really had an independent existence? Great question. Indeed, it's very fascinating how a lot of scholars and people uh, correlate and link Russian Federation to Kievan Rus. So for me, as a scholar, first crucial thing is a language. So Ukrainian language appeared earlier than Russian language, and we have archaeological proofs for that. For example, what people were writing on monuments, rocks, and so on and so on. So having a material object with Ukrainian language in uh, 11th century and not having that in Russian, it's one thing that uh, we based our assumption the Ukrainian state and Ukrainian culture. So yeah, Ukrainian state, we cannot talk about Ukrainian state. We can take about Ukraine talk about Ukrainian identity in Ukrainian culture was present there on the 11th century while Russian language and culture was not. Another thing is folk tales. Um, do you know when first Russian folk, folk songs was recorded? Mm, I guess the sort of late 18th or early 19th century, I guess. Exactly. And Ukrainian ones, it's like 8th, 9th, 10th, and 11th century. Oh, that's much earlier than I would have guessed. I was going to say 11th or 12th, but yeah, that's much earlier. Yeah, uh, and also, uh, the Kievan Rus was also a diverse state, which had a lot of relationship and different identities. And was pretty democratic. So if you really want to find something that will lead you to Russia, you will. But in general, broadly speaking, the Ukrainian culture was dominant there. And also, uh, another proof is language which was spoken in church, written, and the literature. And actually, it's very nice pre-imperial state of Ukrainian identity. And we wish to get back there when Ukrainians were having nice international relationship. There was flourishing in publishing, in translations, and literature represented all different genres. It's extraordinary, isn't it? And um, that appropriation 
of uh, Ukrainian identity uh, carried on strongly through the 19th century, didn't it? And into the Soviet period. Um, so we see artists like Repin labeled as Russian. We see Gorgel labeled as, as Russian. Uh, but when you dig into those works, um, you find a sort of, uh, you know, Gorgel didn't just write the St. Petersburg tales. He had a period of Ukrainian tales as well. So you dig in and you find markers that clearly denote these artists as being Ukrainian, having strong Ukrainian influence. Um, what I want to ask in relation to that, because I know we're, we're coming to the end soon, um, and that is also about a sense of a lost golden age. I think what Russia and Ukraine have in common is a sense that there were periods in history that were stronger uh, for those entities than others, but it manifests in a very, very different way, doesn't it? Uh, in Ukraine, you've got a sense of the literary renaissance in the 20s that was wiped out by the repression, and then the Holodomor, you've got the 19th century emergence of identity that was wiped out. You have various periods, as you say, of, of Ukrainian identity through Kiev and Rus and later, but constantly being, uh, uh, you know, overwhelmed by different imperial entities, um, you know, under the, um, I don't, was it under the, the un, under one imperial period, actually, you know, a certain sort of freedom to sort of practice culture locally. Um, but it's this ebb and flow in a sense that things have been stronger in the past and you want to get back to them. Russia also seems to be driven by the idea of a lost golden age. Um, but whether that actually existed, you know, whether that is just a an invention, uh, it seems far more toxic and backward looking. Whereas this idea of a sort of golden age in Ukrainian culture seems to project forward looking uh, to innovate and, and get to that point through through a creativity in in russian it seems to be through a repetition of a kind of ossified and mythologized version of the past so i've used a lot of words there but hopefully that makes some sense yeah exactly completely agree with you and uh, we had an experience of pre-imperialistic cultural development we still remember how good to be free people and just do boring stuff enjoy literature as an art not as in resistance and it's so good to remember that because you know what to project over your future and exactly for history of russia it keep constantly attacking and annexing and invading countries and other things we keep constantly doing, we keep ruining empires. You know, Ukraine was the object of Hungarian imperial ambitious, Austrian Hungarian ambitious, German and Russian. But each time we get back to independence. So it's so having all this generational traumas is combined with having uh, all this generational surviving and resisting tools quite successful so that's what we project in our future and i hope so much that next year we will talk with you only about art maybe about beautiful metaphors about nice work with text and sentences and zero attention to national security because it will be safe i mean that could be interesting there could be a genre of uh, rebuilding literature uh, when it comes to sort of, you know, not even recreating, because you, I'm guessing that, that, that cities like uh, Bakhmut, Solidar and, and, and others, you know, when they are uh, liberated, planners are not going to go back and say, OK, let's just rebuild a Soviet planned city or let's go back and rebuild a, a 19th century city. I mean, that might be quite nice to go back to postcards of how these places looked before they were wiped out in the second world war um there, there there's going to be i assume a, a vigorous debate um about you know how these cities are, are are created uh with a sort of future looking and we know from our experience in the uk that a lot of mistakes were made in the 1960s when people sort of decided to plan cities from scratch or tear down historic uh, architecture to build uh, new brutalist structures it's going to be quite i think um uh, a dynamic and uh, process and and maybe there's going to be quite a lot of conflict even involved in in um, in debates around rebuilding do you, do you think that's going to have some kind of literary genre focusing on that 
Yeah, I believe. Uh, what I definitely discovered during this war is that all of these uh, fields we used to, to divide, they are pretty artificial. Any, any work you do, any expertise you have, it always can deal with state main, making national security and economy and therefore with reconstruction. I keep thinking was about one very amazing phenomena, isolation art center in Donetsk. In 20, I guess, in 2011 or 2010, uh, one Ukrainian woman who is art curator and work with artistic spaces uh, bought an old factory in Donetsk and made from that very modern, financially successful exhibition cent center for contemporary art. And they were holding festivals there. And also it was... Uh, more working places, more tourism, and more development for the region. And they were having their last festivals a few days prior to the invasion in 2014. So all artistic and literary uh, stuff, it also create workplaces and also bring more tourists and impact life a lot. So it's it will be a huge amount of problems with reconstruction in a huge amount of responsibilities and possibilities including creative sector because it's also a lot of working places and that's that's good i mean it also um you know this is probably the last question but also a uh, so many people are abroad at the moment so many people are refugees in countries and some of them maybe putting roots down some of them maybe finding jobs and so on i know it's not actually as easy as that having uh, you know met many dozens of uh, sort of refugees in the uk um but somehow ukrainian state and actually civil society that you talk about there is going to have to attract these people back uh to places that are going to be very difficult to actually sort of resettle and rebuild so do you think this sort of vibrant artistic and, and sort of cultural movement and creating centers of art within the ruins could be something that actually entices people to come back and invest their lives uh, in Ukraine's future? I believe so. It will be part of that. You're absolutely right that people are settling down, especially kids. They are getting used to everything much faster than adults. But also... Not only art attract Ukraine, it attract Ukrainians, get back to Ukraine and foreigners. Uh, the plus of Ukraine, the life here is very dynamic and we do not have a lot of bureaucracy. So uh, since the full scale invasion, I started working more as a translator, providing my services. So I just opened my private entity in order to provide services and pay taxes in my smartphone it, it took me 15 minutes and i pay my taxes really fast and it's so user-friendly uh services are so amazing here so you will never get such a good haircut abroad for a foldable amount of money as in ukraine and that's considered all services the food is so amazing the coffee is amazing it's so hard to 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 find good coffee abroad but in ukraine even during the war sasha dojic will tell you more about that but when she went to donetsk area in the almost destroyed city you will easily found amazing lattes or rough with soy milk and another stuff that we experience that in the darkest time you can consolidate and do what you want and we are not having this depression or fears a lot of energy that will definitely attract people despite the fact that our daily life is so dark we we have very optimistic and very vivid energies that just spread us through the air and push you to be braver by uh, by making your own dreams happen so it's not only culture but the huge mix of all the best things we had, I definitely sure that will attract people. And uh, all my friends who were 
coming here just for a short visit, they were feeling here safer and easier and more satisfied with everything than abroad. Because another another part of decolonization is very natural decolonization. When you go abroad and all, you see all other sides of Europe with bureaucracy, with fear, when people are believing that Russia is a great power and there is nothing to do, you would have to surrender. And here you're not surrendering. So I believe the mix of all our experience and all our victory successes will help us to have more people here to deal with all problems we have because it's also a huge, nice bunch of problems. Well, that's an incredibly uplifting and um, liberating message there. And I think probably we won't get better than that. So that's probably a great place to end on. Um, very few of my videos, I have to say, end particularly optimistically, but this is, and I think we need to treasure that, uh, that sort of positive message. Um, Maria, what you're doing is incredibly important. Of course, we're going to put links in this video to the books, the authors, and the organizations that you've mentioned. Um, I'm only at the start of my journey, and I hope people watching this will start to explore Ukrainian literature and get that sense of freedom and liberation, which has helped you, your country to resist uh, aggression, not just on behalf of yourselves, but on behalf of all of Europe. And I think that's something we also need to wake up to. Um, but thank you so much and Slava Ukraini. Hero, I'm Slava. Thank you as well. I deeply appreciate your attention.